United Nations itself has, has realized that we're kind of late in the game when it comes to conflict, so it's reactionary, and therefore themselves call for a bit more, let's look at prevention. So if I may read a statement from their um, review from 2015, they say, if more global priority were consistently given to efforts at sustaining peace, might there not, over the course of time, be reduced need for crisis response? So I want to give you an example of why so far the world has been looking more at crisis response rather than prevention. So imagine you want to see whether a vase is fragile. Okay. So the, re the way we tend to evaluate whether things are fragile are by looking at when they break. So they fall on the floor and we realize, oh, this was a fragile vase. Or we might even throw it on the floor. Okay. And yeah, this is kind of how our response conflict conflict breaks out. And then we realize, oh yes, Syria was was fragile. You know, it's it's ex post. And why is this such a huge problem? Well, think of the base. Now the base is broken. You have to put it back together, glue it. it takes a lot of work. And then afterwards, it's still fragile. And it's not in its pristine, uh, stable state it was before. And that's kind of how it is with conflict. So conflict itself is very persistent. But even once it ends, uh, it's, it's very recurrent. Okay? This is what one refers to as the conflict trap. Because there are different fractions in the country that hate each other. There are the open wounds. It's very hard to reconcile. There are a lot of different interest groups. And it's very hard to get a country that once was in conflict back into a peaceful state. So, to, to bring an analogy from the base of the countries, what one does is one sees an outbreak of violence, and then one says, oh yeah, so that country is fragile. Um, and, and it's much more urgent, and, and that's what the media looks at, that's what policymakers look at, and that's where one says we have to intervene, should we send troops there, uh, what should we do? Uh, but. You know, just like with the base, maybe one should have avoided it breaking in the first place. Okay, but there is a reason why policy focuses on... So there are two reasons why policy tends to focus on, on conflicts after they happen. One is, well, because it's very salient. It's very hard to tell people, look, there's this peaceful country that we think might become a problem. Let's focus on that. What they will say is, hey, look, here we have basket cases where problems are... You know, there's countries that are burning. We have to go there. Okay, that's that's kind of the salient. <clears throat> but also, there's the problem of prediction. Okay, how do we know which country might be going off into violence? How can we foresee violence in a previously peaceful country? So that makes prevention very hard. <clears throat> this is where where we come in. Okay, we think uh, prediction. Improved predictions can also improve our set of options in order to prevent conflict before it breaks out. So the idea is that we want to create risk measures which are really capturing unrealized conflict. Okay, so there's a country that maybe has been stable for many years, but it seems to be heading into a problematic direction. Because predicting the other cases is very easy. I go to all the countries that recently had a conflict, and I say, oh, this is where conflict might happen. But again, these are already in the conflict track. Okay? It's, it's oh, be more likely to be correct there, but the benefits are much lower of predicting a conflict there because the problem is already there. So uh, I'll give you a quote from a paper by, a research paper by Vasi and co-authors. They say, even with such unusually rich data, however, the models poorly predict new outbreaks or escalations of violence. And in our most recent work, we refer to this as the, the hard problem. So previously peaceful countries that destabilize. So how do we deal with this problem? What is we look at our predictions separate? Okay, we look at the predictions where there was previously conflict. As I said, that's quite easy to do well there. But that's not how we evaluate all of our predictions. We also take all the previously peaceful countries and look how well did we predict conflict 
in those that previously were peaceful. The okay? problem is there, you have, well, the good thing is you have few cases, but from a forecaster's perspective, that is a problem, because you don't have much to learn from statistics. Okay? This was an academic project that we started probably in 2012 and has branched out into many projects and also uh, into lots of policy work. And also we made some of it public, so if you feel like it, you can uh, have a look at our website called conflictforecast.org. That's basically just a snapshot of what we're doing, there's going to be a lot more to come. <clears throat> so to, to make a bit more explicit what the goal of our exercise is, is that we want to aggregate expert information to forecast political violence. What do I mean by expert information? So in our case, that's going to be newspaper text. Okay? We're going to use vast amounts of newspaper articles. We're going to use machine learning, which then understands what people are writing about. And then we use the variation of what people are writing about in order to predict the product content. Okay? And specifically what we're trying to do is, we're trying to predict conflict, trying to predict conflict one month before it breaks out. Okay? We, we do many exercises, we predict it three months before it breaks out, 12 months, every policy maker has a different wish, so we, we, we do it all. Um, we're also working on predicting uh, the intensity of violence, but here today, most of what I'm going to show you is really just, there's peace, yeah? so that's what I mean by, by the zeros, okay? that's a, a non-conflict country, so there's a bunch of zeros, and then what we're trying to predict is that bold facts black zero, okay? Because that is the what preceding of what, which is the outbreak of violence, okay? And then what you see as missings there, that those dots, I mean that we're not looking at those, those are the years of continuing conflict, or the months, yeah? Because that's very easy. If there, there is conflict somewhere, it's very likely to be conflict there again, okay? So those we don't try to predict. I mean, we, we do it as well at some point, just to show how easy it is, but, but that's, that's not the, the interesting and important exercise. However, that's basically what the policy world focuses on. Uh, they go to where conflict already is happening. And then it's really, really hard to get anybody to sit at the table and, and talk to each other. It's already too late. So the way we do this is we use, so I'll use a, I'll be light on equations but I'll use some technical language, but since you guys are the, the next generation, yeah, I'm sure you're ready all with your Python and uh, um, coding, so, so if I talk about, you wouldn't get scared. If I present this to academics, they often get scared when they see this, because they're, you know, coding and stuff like that is, for a lot of people, they, they're from a different generation. But you guys will be very used to this. So what we do is unsupervised machine learning to, to summarize text. Unsupervised means that the model just detects patterns without relating them to conflict. Okay? We, I'll show you in a second how we could. We throw all the news at this algorithm, and it starts to learn of what words appear together, and then it forms topics about that. Okay? In a second, I'll give you some very specific examples. So out of this, we get topics. So what the news is about. That might be sports, it might be tourism, it might be conflict. And then we use the appearance and disappearance of these topics in a supervised machine learning model, which I'm also going to try to give you the information, to predict conflict. Okay, the idea is that maybe the month before conflict breaks out, people start writing less about tourism. Yeah? Because probably you don't want to travel to a place that's about to have a war. And uh, for the supervised machine learning, we're going to use a random forest, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick uh, run through of, of how that works. And then, to add a bit more of an economic spin, um, we will feed these predictions into an intervention framework. The idea is a policymaker can decide what countries should I do an intervention. Okay? And they can either do prevention, so before conflict breaks out, or intervention, so somewhere where there is conflict or there was just conflict. Okay? And there, what well, seems that with improved predictions, you're going to shift more and more from intervention to prevention. And what is one of the great advantages of using newspaper text in this exercise? Well, it's there's, there's depth and there's width. Okay. So uh, what do I mean by that? 
It's available for all countries on the globe. Uh, we can find news about every single place. But also, it's, it goes back long in time. Yeah, we can have consistent data to learn from, from 1980 until now. But also, it's available in real time. Okay? We, we could have a model if we had the human resources and uh, computational resources to update our model every single day. Problem is, it's just a bunch of us with a few computers, so we do it monthly. So most of this, uh, as I mentioned, is pretty much all of this is with my co-author, Hannes Müller, who's at the, the Institute of Economic Analysis in, in Barcelona. So let's look at some patterns of conflict. Okay, this map is, might be hard to see for those in the back. So these are our uh, current grid cells. So here, basically, the globe is separated into thousands of little grid cells. And here we're looking at which of these grid cells currently have conflict. This was in December 2021. And dark red means that there's more than 15 fatalities in that uh, grid cell. Um, then you know, the, the light yellow is, is uh, at least one. Okay, So one to two. And white means there's no battle. Okay, so you can see we have a few dots spread around, uh, across the globe. Um, they are somewhat concentrated, uh, also kind of along the equator. Um, but yeah, you can also see that you know where there's one red dot, there's likely to be another red dot nearby. Okay, so it's not randomly distributed across the globe. So some of the work I'm going to be talking about today is we're predicting conflict at the country level. But in our recent research, we're moving to this grid cell. Okay? Because the idea is, you might, you know, uh, I don't want to give examples of countries here, but some countries are really big, and there's you know, a billion uh, people there, so one battle death there is a terrible thing, but it is somewhat likely to happen, just by pure law of large number. Okay? Whereas, you know, if you go to the grid cell level, there you're actually considering, you know, at this place, they might be fighting breaking out. So this is a statistical way of showing the, the conflict pattern. So on the x-axis, you have the month since the last battle death in a grid cell. Okay? And on the y-axis, you have the probability of having a battle death next period, so next month. Okay? So you can see that coming out of conflict, yeah, first so after one month, I've been one month, little grid cell on that map that we saw. You've been one month in peace. You find that you're still facing a 35% probability of falling back into violence. Okay, so there's not really much reason to celebrate it. Uh, it's a very gloomy future. A 35% probability of falling back into violence the next month. Okay, but you can also see that this decays fairly quickly. Okay, so already six, seven months after you're out of battle death, so you've made it half a year, now people fighting again. Now your probability of having another battle death is down to 10%. Okay? And then you see the line starts converging downwards, yeah? and two years after your last battle death, you're down to like 1% probability of going into a new conflict next month. That's still pretty bad, yeah. 1% sounds low, but, but it's bad. You know, I, I don't want to every month face the probability of next month being in conflict. Okay? But 35%, of course, is huge. That's a really gloomy future for one of these unhappy grid cells. But we can break it down further. And that's what's nice about the grid cell level. So here on the x-axis, you have the number of your neighboring grid cells so that are touching you that are in conflict, so they have at least one battle day. Yeah. And here you can see it's bad to have bad neighbors. Yeah. If all of your neighbors are in, in conflict, then you face, uh, and you're at peace, okay? People are happy in your grid cell, uh, celebrating. Uh, if all of your neighbors are in trouble, uh, then next month you have a 50% probability of break of collapsing into violence. And you can see that this is almost linear. So every bad neighbor is a bad apple that is, is increasing the probability for you to fall into conflict. So 
So basically, if you have no neighbor in conflict, you face a, a minuscule probability of experiencing violence. Yeah? If you just have one, we are ready to, let's say, like 2 3%. Yeah, probably more. Four. Okay. So you can see here, there's an important spatial component. And you can imagine how this happens. Yeah. You know, some of them might, just might physically spill over. They're fighting over there, and they're like fighting over here. But maybe also uh, there's certain religious groups or political groups that are fighting there, and then the same groups in the neighboring grid cells start having problems with each other. Or weapons are being transported through. Uh, so there's all kind of different ways. I'm not going to be talking much about causal ways today. Okay? I'm not going to be telling you why a conflict breaks out. Yeah, is it uh, due to the economy or due to natural resources? Because you have diamonds. Yeah, there's, there's lots of research on that. Very interesting work. But uh, today I'm more really going to just be talking about the predictive exercise and the, the geospatial features rather than the actual reasons. So here we see that uh, this is basically the combination of the two figures you've seen. Okay? So on the x axis, you have the month since your last battle death. And, on, and then we have on the y axis again, the probability. So you're in peace. Now, uh, the x axis shows how long you've been in peace. On the y axis, we have again the probability of you falling into violence the next month. Then we have two lines. One is the black line, which is everyone around you is peacefully happy. Okay? You have good neighbors. The red line is you're in peace, but at least one of your neighbors is in conflict. So what you can see is, even if you had conflict last year, but all of your neighbors are in peace, things don't look that bad. Okay, you only face about a five percent probability of falling into conflict next year. However, if you're coming out of conflict and one of your neighbors is in conflict, that's the red line. Things look pretty bad, even after 24 months. Yeah, you still face a five percent probability of falling back into conflict. This is another way of showing that. So on the x-axis, you have the number of neighboring cells that are in conflict. And on the y-axis, you have the months that you have been experiencing in peace. Okay, so, and then the darker the cell, the more likely you are going to experience a conflict next month. Yeah. So if you look at the top left, that's None of your neighbors are in conflict, and you've just come out of the conflict. Okay, and you can see that shade is not so bad. Now, if you move from the top left to the top right, right, so it's still you just coming out of conflict, but on the, all the way to the right, all of your neighbors are in conflict, well, you can see it becomes quite dark red. Things look pretty bad. And you can basically see, whenever you're moving this way, so the more neighbors you have with conflict, the worse it looks. And basically, usually when you're moving down, yeah, the longer you are in peace, the better things. Now, once you get to this, all the way to the right, to the bottom, there are no observations anymore. Okay, so you rarely have someone who has eight neighbors in conflict, but has experienced twelve months of peace. Why is this? Well, because of the conflict trap. These are basically a bunch of cells that are just going in and out of conflict. So, so far I've been talking about your immediate neighbors, but obviously it's not only your immediate neighbor that matters, because your immediate neighbor also has other immediate neighbors. Okay. So here on the x-axis, what I'm showing you is the closest cell to you that is in conflict. Yeah, so it's not. So if the number is one, yeah, that's your neighbor. If the number is two, it's someone that's next yeah, until five. Minutes. Okay, so you're, you're moving further and further away from yourself, uh, looking whether someone is in conflict. And then again, on the y-axis is the probability of you experiencing a conflict next year. And you can, here you can see that it's not only your immediate neighbors, yeah, but even when four or five cells away from you, someone is experiencing violence, you're more likely to experience a conflict next year. And again, 
we can imagine many reasons why. Yeah? Weapons are flowing, uh, groups are starting to hate each other, um, and, and so on. And it's also it's kind, of, kind of a mechanical thing. If you look at this over a longer time period, it would look even worse because obviously, you know, you get the spillovers. Yeah? Your neighbor that is someone else's neighbor with someone else's neighbor it spills over all the way over you over multiple months. Okay? But remember, this is always just the next month that I'm looking at. And even there, it looks bad enough. And then here, I in some way bring all of these pieces of information together. Uh, unfortunately, the shades of gray are not very distinguishable on, on, on this slide. But um, so what they mean is how many, how distant are the cells that are in conflict? Okay, so if it's if it's gray, it's at least there are five cells away from you. If it's dark black, it's uh, your neighbor cell. Okay, and on the x-axis you have the months since battle death, and on the y-axis, you have the probability of you experiencing battle death next year. Okay? And then, what you see is that if you're just coming out of a conflict, and your immediate neighbor is in conflict, that we already saw before, things are bad, but even if it's someone who's two cells away from you, that would be that second line that you can see there, I don't have a pointer, but that second line from the top uh, is also quite elevated. Okay? So basically, what, what all these figures have shown you is that there's the conflict trap. When you're coming out of conflict, you're really likely to go back into conflict. There's the, the geospatial thing. Right? If your neighbors are in conflict, you are very likely to be in conflict. So now while these two things, for me as a forecaster, are great, yeah, it's, it's terrible, we're talking about conflict, but thinking about my life as a forecaster, it's, it's very easy to predict conflict. I only look where there was conflict, and there it's going to happen again. I look where there is conflict, and next to it it's going to happen. Okay? But now this is where newspaper text is going to come in. Because what we want is some other information which tells us that conflict might be happening in a previous peaceful country. So our <coughs> database are about one million articles from the New York Times and the Congress. And we have, uh, it's growing by the month, so in the meantime, it's 5 million articles from the BBC Monitor, uh, Associated Press, and, and Latin News. So these three that I just mentioned, those are basically not newspapers, those are news aggregators that also collect news from local news a agencies, yeah? uh, translate them. So we're, that's why I said before, we're trying to aggregate expert information. These are people who are, there's editors who are filtering information, who are looking what's important somewhere, and, and putting this into these news databases. And then we uh, use those in a, in a fancy way that I'm going to show you in a second. So we download all the articles that have either the country name in the title or um, a capital name. And so it gives us more than 5 million articles on 190 countries from 1980. So what I'm not going to show you currently, we're running a, a fancy algorithm which is trying to detect uh, all the locations within the articles. Because obviously if we want to learn more about the grid cell levels, uh, then some news that's about country A might not be telling me what's going on in a certain grid cell within that country. <clears throat> so the machine learning algorithm we use to summarize the, the newspaper articles is called the latent Dirichlet allocation. So what is that? You could imagine that so it summarizes the newspaper into topics. Okay? And you can imagine topics as an urn where journalists draw from when writing about a certain topic. Uh, so imagine there is the, the sports urn. Right? The journalist goes to the sports urn, starts drawing, closes his or her eyes, and starts drawing words from it, which are most likely to be words like team, goal, win. And then another journalist wants to write about conflict. So he or she goes to the conflict urn, closes his eyes, and draws words from it. And these are words like war, violence, army, but also win. Okay, so you, here you see a many. Yeah? Each word can be in different topics. Okay, win, in this case, is both in the conflict urn, but it's also in the sports urn. So the algorithm does learns from the co-occurrence of words. It sees, when it's looking through articles, that sport, where army and window is appearing together, and it starts forming a topic about it. 
But at the same time, it also sees that the words goal, team, and win always appear together. So it starts forming a topic term. But also, each article can be about multiple topics. Okay? So I did my PhD in Barcelona, and there, the, the biggest political event of the year is always when X in Barcelona play against Real Madrid. And when the journalists write about that the next day, yeah, they go to both the conflict urn and the sports urn. So how does this actually work? So here's a, an article, more or less randomly chosen. It's called something, the title is something like Libyan Prince Confronts Rebels, or something. from 1991 from the New York Times. And we don't have enough time to read this whole article. That's what we use machines for. We're going to let a machine summarize it for us. So how does the machine do it? First, we want to make the life of the machine a bit easier. Then we get rid of what are called soft words. It is a library of words that don't contain a lot of information. The, of, as, okay? We kick those out. So this is what the argument looks like. Then we want to make the life for the machine a bit easier. So we do something that is called lemmatizing and stemming. Okay, so linguists at some point define what are the roots of certain words. Because what you want is that run, ran, and running are not four different words. Uh, you just want it to be the stem, which is run. Okay, so you can see that if the word like beginning in the middle is going to be chopped into begin, ask is going to be chopped into ask. Okay? So now, this is what it looks like. We further simplify the life of the computer. And now, well, this is what one refers to as a, a, a bag of words. Okay? We, each article, all these five million articles, are now a bag of words that looks like this. And now we feed those into the machine. Okay? So if you are, are familiar with matrix, uh, with writing matrix, this is what we actually feed in. So you have left hand side the list of all the words. Okay? So in our case, it's 100,000 words, because we also create two and three word combinations. And then you have the five million articles and the word counts. Okay, so each entry, each column in this matrix is an article with a count of how often a word appears in that column, so in that article. Okay, so now the algorithm, as I said before, it learns that these words appear together, starts forming topics around it, and it comes out with something like this. Okay? So we ex post look at this and call it the economics topic. That's, we never told the algorithm find an economics topic. Okay. The algorithm just saw that the words, so here are the biggest, the, so the, the uh, size of the word here is proportional to its importance in this topic. Okay, so this you can imagine, this is Ern I was talking about before. This is where the, the <clears throat> journalist will go to when writing about economics. Okay, he or she will close their eyes and will pull out bank, billion, economy, finance. Okay? Quite consistent. All well, these words, export, trade, yeah, so these are growth, these are all like economics words. So this is what the algorithm back up. Another one it comes up with is tourism. Yeah? Some of these things we might not really remember, but it's, uh, you can see like uh, art, museum, hotel, wine. Yeah? So it seems that these words are appearing together in an article, so it starts forming a topic about it. And then here's something which is more related to violence. Okay? Rebel, army, force, war, military. Okay? So this is what we then call the conflict topic. But what we call it is not actually important. That I'm just doing for, for exposition. So remember, I, I promise you, you don't have to read that whole article. You'll have the machine summarize it for us. So here's the bag of words. So now the, art, the, the algorithm is going to tell us so it didn't only learn what these topics are, so it's now also going to tell us what share of each topic is this article about. So let's see. Tourism? Not much. 4%. Where did this association come from? So you can see there's words like train, roam is somewhere, journey. So those are kind of touristic words. So it gives some association to the, between this article and tourism. Economics? 2%, not much. Yeah? And from reading that article, it didn't look much like, like tourism, yeah, like economics. Okay? Where does this association come from from words like govern, country, 
control Spain. So it's a very mild economics uh, flavor as well. But then the conflict topic is a lot more prominent. So it tells us this article is 27% conflict. Where does this association come from? Army, force, guerrilla, base, combat. Okay? So this is now what the algorithm tells us about, about more than 5 million articles. Yeah? Each article tells us this one's about that, 80%, 20%, whatever. So we can use the appearance and the disappearance of these to predict conflict. So here is a, a politics topic, uh, how it varies across the, the UK and the US. Yeah, so you can see big spikes in the top you see in the US, in the bottom of the US, you can see big spikes of the politics topic <coughs> around a big political events. Yeah? So around elections, the Brexit referendum, the Brexit turmoil. Um, yeah, so there are always when these things are happening, the politics topic spikes. Yeah? But now you might say, okay, I don't need uh, five million articles, I know when elections happen. Yeah? Um, the good thing is, you know, it's telling you this about 190 countries, what is going on. Okay? From 1980 until now. It's also very adaptive, in a way, this, this algorithm. So here we see the health topic in January 2020. So we call it health. It has words like uh, disease, doctor, um, hospital, okay? Three months later, the health topic suddenly prominently hears words like virus, spread, quarantine, yeah? So it's, it's adapted to all these terrible words we've added to our vocabulary and suddenly have to come from that. <clears throat> so here we can see a bit more how it varies in a few countries. Uh, the, the red lines are the terror topic, and the, the blue line is the economics topic. And uh, you can see that, for instance, Angola during, uh, so you, you can see the terror topic with stabilization really dropped, yeah? and the economics topic became more, more prominent there. In Iraq, however, you can see it never talks about economics, basically. It's just different shades of terror, especially with 9-11 that have exploded and has stayed high since. And in Ukraine, you can see that recently there's a lot more um, focus on terror rather than than economy. So this one is a bit trickier. So here on the x-axis, you have how much more a certain topic appears before a hard onset. So in a previously peaceful country, uh, outbreak of violence. And then on the y-axis, you have how much more likely a topic appears before a normal conflict. Okay? So this is just to give you an idea of how the algorithm later is going to learn. Yeah? It picks up these topics, like peace agreements and terror, which are much more likely to happen to, to increase before a conflict breaks out in a country that was previously peaceful, but now faces a conflict. Okay? So I, uh, it's a bit tricky to figure out what goes to each other for that, because I want to still show you how, how the machine learning then predicts conflict. But what we learned from this news is we know how much is reported about each topic in each country over time. And then we're going to feed these topics into the machine learning algorithm, and then it sees the positive but also negative associations. Yeah? There's less writing about tourism before conflict breaks out. <coughs> so, a rare forest. Uh, here's the technical stuff. I'll, I'll go straight into the example. So this might be hard to read, but I'll, I'll read it out for you. So this is a, a simplified decision tree. Okay? So how does this algorithm work? In the top, so what it does, it takes all the variables we put in as a predictor, and then it tries to find one, the one variable and the cutoff, which best discriminates between conflicts that are going to, where conflicts are going to break out and where conflicts are not going to break out. So here it looks first at the international relations topic. And if you wrote less than 10% about that, the decision tree would go down the left-hand side. And if there, in that country there was more than 10% written about international relations, it's going to go down the right-hand side. Then there again, it looks at all the countries that are in this situation, all the predictors we have. And then what it finds out is that now the terror tap topic is very important. So now it looks at all the countries that have written less or more than 3% about terror. Okay, so let's imagine it was written more than that. Then we go down that side of the tree. Now the variable it finds is the most important discriminator is the number of months you've had since you've had 50 battle deaths in, in, in that country. 
Okay, if that number is less than 10.5, yeah, then you go down the left. If it's more, you go down the right. So imagine you had less than 10.5 months since your last time fifty battle deaths. Yeah, then we're left with a sample of 100. And, uh, sorry, that's, that's a mistake. There. So there's 115 countries that were in this situation. And we see that 44 out of these 150 countries that have, in other words, high reporting on international relations, high reporting on terror, and recently experienced armed conflict, they're likely to see an outbreak in the next month. Okay, so that's a very high probability. 44 out of 115. So that's like a 40 percent probability. Okay, so the algorithm has discriminated between countries that are likely or unlikely to fall into conflict. And now. What you actually have to imagine, and this is a, a simplified tree, it's only a depth of four, but actually the trees we use are much deeper. They have like a depth of eight, and we use 600 of them. Okay, so it's not as simple as this, but this gives you the idea of how it works. So the, the predictors we feed in are the conflict histories, so or the geographic features, uh, some country level and conflict information, the neighbors that are in conflict, and the news. Okay, and then we train the model until, uh, say, December 2018, and then we predict January 2019. Then we train the model until January 2019 and predict the next one, and so on. Okay? We never use the information from the future when we predict this. So now let's, this is a, a little GIF or GIF, I never know what it's called. Um, <coughs> someone know? It's a vote. Is it a GIF? Is it a GIF? Okay, the other side. Um, okay, so here's our here are our predictions. So is, that's what everyone that's what everyone's going to remember from this talk. Uh, so so here's the world map the, in cells, and these are the, our predictions for the next month. Okay, the redder the cell, the more likely there's going to be an outbreak. If it's black, well, conflict's going on. Okay, and then this is how the world basically has been evolving over the months. And you can see it's almost always in like the same regions, unfortunately, for those regions. But there is some movement going on. Okay? So this is what our model does. Every month tells you where are you likely to have problems. Okay? Uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. I'll just tell you the model does really well at okay? uh, What contributes a lot to the prediction? So here, on the, on the x-axis, so basically these are ranked by how much they add to the prediction. Okay, so the top ones are the variables that add the most power to our prediction. And then if it goes like to the right, then it's positively uh, related to conflict. If it goes to the left, it's more negatively. Okay, so what you can see in the board, the, I won't go into details here, but basically whether you recently had conflict are the most important features. Yeah? So the months since your last battle death, um, then months since 50 battle deaths. But then, at some point, you can start seeing that like things like religion, peace agreements, uh, trade, also are giving a lot of information. Okay, so we're getting a lot of information here out of our news model as well. This is another way of showing it. So here we, we rank the strength of predictors. Yeah? So the red line shows you how likely the model says there's going to be conflict. And then the black lines are constant Then the next period. Okay, so what you want is that all the black lines are to this side, because that's where you're predicting more conflict. And we can see that that's the case. So where we basically say the probability is very low, you very rarely see one of these black lines. Okay? So now, <clears throat> I want to add a bit of an economic spin. Yeah, so why, why is it so important that we can predict these conflicts? Well, you know, uh, it's important for financial markets, for whether you want to withdraw your citizens there, uh, but also, as I said, for intervention. Yeah? So we're going to calculate prevention gains, where it depends on the probability of an escalation with intervention times the long-term cost of escalation, minus the probability of escalation without intervention times the long-term cost of, of escalation. Okay? And then you also have to consider the cost of intervention. So what is the trade-off? If you intervene a lot in low-risk countries, and you have bad forecasts, yeah, then you have very high intervention costs. 
and you, you, inter you go everywhere. Yeah? We'll prevent conflict everywhere. Super expensive. Uh, and you've probably also not prevented that many conflicts because you know, you've gone into all kinds of super peaceful places. The other problem is I wait until the base falls on the ground and it's broken. Yeah? Example. I only go where it is conflict. So here I intervene very late. So those countries are already in the conflict trap. So I'm trying to stabilize a place that's basically a basket. So this is a way to illustrate that. So now imagine the likelihood of an outbreak of, of armed violence in a relatively stable country is 1%. Yeah, so now if I randomly intervene in, in these countries, then I'm going to have to intervene. So imagine, you know, it costs uh, 100 million, and I have no idea which one of these 100 dots is going to have to conflict. Okay? So then I intervene 100 times at a cost of 100 million, so this is going to cost me 10 million. But now, imagine I can improve my forecast to get a precision of 10%. Okay. So now we're only going to have to intervene in 10 countries. So what we do is we, we use our predictions to put countries into like 13 states which, which illustrate the violence. Okay? The idea is the country that is in, in peace after suffering violence still has a gloomy future. Okay, so I won't go into detail about each of the states. Uh, basically, one to five imagine is peaceful. Six to eight are ones that um, just had a conflict, and nine to thirteen are different intensities of conflict. Okay, so this is how you can imagine. This is stable peace, nice future, high kinetic energy. You're up on the hill. Okay, that's where the policymaker wants them to be. Now the problem is when you're here. There's some flags, okay? There's some warning flags, and now you're heading for the abyss, okay? But it still looks kind of good, you're still quite high. 